What's going on, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us here at Chad's Media for another episode of The Tyler Lennon Show. On behalf of Front Porch News and Chad's Media, I'm Tyler Lennon. Before we get started, I want to say a quick thank you to our sponsors, Avco Roofing in Sulphur Springs, The Beauty Parlor in Sulphur Springs, Robin Bo Shears Chiropractic with Lone Star Clinic, and Realtor Lindsay Lee with Watson Company in Sulphur Springs. A big thank you to each of those businesses. We have a very special episode for you today. Joining us, we have our guest, Keenan Clayton. Keenan, thank you so much for taking the time to join us, man. I oh, man, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Yes, sir. So uh, for anyone that doesn't know, we actually have gotten to do pretty much this interview before, but just off camera. But right. that was uh, going into this past year, going into your first year of coaching. Obviously, we'll have a lot more to talk about now. But oh, yeah. I want to ask, man, how's it, how's it feel to be back? Oh, man, it feels great. Uh, can't ask for a better place to be, especially like we talked before, me growing up around this area. And I mean, it just feels good, honestly. I have to ask. Uh, let's let's kind of start there. Obviously, you're from Sulphur Springs. You're a mm -hmm. you're a former Wildcat. Can you kind of talk us through your playing career here in Sulphur Springs a little bit, and kind of what the recruiting process was you or was like for you? Uh, like I said before, born and raised here. Um, going into high school, uh, we had coaching change. We had a guy Brad Turner, and he brought in a bunch of young guys with a lot of energy. And my freshman year, didn't really know if football was what I wanted to do because I come, like a lot of my uncles and cousins, everybody played basketball. So I've always heard your father was an amazing basketball player and as well. my dad, he was a pretty good basketball player. Um, I haven't seen any film on him, but I haven't heard one person say that he was a bad player. Yeah, I think I've told you this before, but uh, my, my father was a good basketball player as well, and I think they played against each other. And uh, any time you were obviously an awesome football player, and we'd talk about you or see you play, but he was always oh, yeah. like, be sure. He's like, his dad, though. His dad was really good at yeah, basketball. Yeah, and I hear uh, any time I go to North Hopkins and anybody finds out that he's my dad, uh, people just tell me all kinds of stories about it. And it's actually a pleasure because I didn't get to actually see him play organized setting. I got to watch him play a lot of pickup coming up as a kid. And you could see it, but I didn't really understand the game then. Right. And now that I understand basketball and when people talk, it's kind of like, you was doing that way back then? <laughs> but, yeah, it was – got to give him the props. I think he probably gave me a little bit of my athletic ability. Just, they just a little bit, just a little just bit of, a it, touch maybe? of it, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what was the recruiting process for you like? For anyone that doesn't know, you end up going to Oklahoma, huge school, Big 12. Um, at what point did you realize, like, okay, I'm going to get these kind of opportunities? Um – well, like I said, freshman year I played freshman ball. Going to my sophomore year, uh, I was playing. I got moved to varsity to play running back. Um, I had a friend by the name of Jonathan Lindley. He ended up signing with SMU in the year before me, 2004. Um, it, was, it was a lot of recruiters coming in, communicating with him, you know, because he was an amazing triple jumper, and very explosive, and he was a good corner. Well, hanging around him, just kind of started getting a little wind here and there. Like, my finally, my first official offer was hanging out with him in his house from Baylor. And that was going into my junior year. I just happened to be at his house when the recruiter came. And it was one of those things like, man, if one of my buddies can do it, I can do it. Like, if he can get them coming in, if I just keep doing what I'm doing and keep my, the right crowd around, everything will work out. But like I said, I got my first offer from Baylor going into my junior year. And that kind of opened my eyes because I really didn't understand the Big 12, the SEC, the Pac-10. I didn't understand any of those things. So what I knew about Baylor is that we had Scotty Lewis go to Baylor, a guy before me. Um, pretty good school, you know. Guys talk good about Scotty. They say he did good things at Baylor. And then I got invited to a camp down at uh, Texas that summer of my junior going into my junior year. Go down to the camp, have a decent day, just kind of raw, didn't really know what was going on. And after the camp, Mac Brown brought me in his office and he was like, well, I want to offer you a scholarship, but if you don't take it now, the offer won't be on the table tomorrow. What? Right. Like, and I'm, look, and I'm looking at Coach, uh, who took us there? Coach Clopton. Um, he's now the soup, uh, superintendent, assistant soup at Kaufman. But uh, anyway, I'm looking at him like, is this how this works? <laughs> I'm sure Mac Brown got a bunch of people doing that, if we're being honest. That's how he got all his recruits, you know? Like, but growing up a kid in Texas, why wouldn't you take that opportunity? Right. But I'm just green. I don't really know. So I'm like, man, I'm not. 
my dad's not here? Like, nah, I need my dad here with me to make sure that this is a good decision, all that. So when I walked out, that was it. They stopped coming around, they stopped coming to recruit, all that. It's like, okay. Going into, after my junior season, more offers started to roll in. I think that they opened the light to everybody else to kind of like, let me check this kid out. Right, and I mean, see if you got Mac Brown, you got University of Texas. Correct. An offer. And so then after that, they started to roll in, started to see recruiters at practice, uh, Arkansas, Baylor, Texas Tech, Oklahoma. I mean, just you name them out of Texas, they was there. TCU, like a lot of these guys there. And – Oklahoma offered me that summer going into my junior year. I mean, going to my senior year. And I really didn't hesitate. It was one of those things like, all right, let me check the roster. Because then I had started getting more wind about how things work, what you should look at right. going into school from different people. So I looked at the roster. Okay, they got two safeties. One's a senior, one's a junior. The junior's going to leave out. Uh, Rodney Poole, he was a junior. They called him too cool for school, Rodney Poole. But, pretty awesome nickname to have. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is your competition, like, oh, I don't know if I can yeah, so beat him out. Yeah, I'm, so I'm looking at it, then I started to watch these, uh, go back and find some of the old games on YouTube and stuff. I'm like, okay, I know this guy. He's, he had a great season. He got, he's going to leave. It's, there's no question about it. So then that only left, like, two safeties on the roster. Gravy. It's, this is all I need. And, then we get to play Texas every year on the right. biggest setting after the way Mac Brown talked to me in his office. I felt disrespected. So why not? And, right. and then in, on top of that, they was top five team going into my senior year and they played at, uh, USC in the national championship that year. That was tough, you know, but I had already signed and stuff. So that, I really killed the process that that's like, cause probably like a week after I communicated with uh, Malcolm Kelly from Longview. He mm -hmm. was a wide receiver. and uh, Who, side note, has one of the greatest freestyles of all time. Yes, Never sir. Never forget the yes, Malcolm sir. Kelly freestyle. <laughs> and what's crazy about that freestyle, I know we're kind of jumping off, that probably wasn't the best one. That was oh, just really? the only one that I've got on I've always film. wondered, like, surely there were more. Like, oh, he was man. probably doing this all the time. All the time. Like, once – it was like a thing. After we win a game, it was one of the linemen. He could play any beat you asked on the trash can. No, oh, no way. Yeah, no way. He come in, flip that trash can over, get the beat going, and then we just call guys out. And then he be the last guy to go. And then he freestyle, and then we call Coach Stoops in the circle, and he hit his old man dance, one leg and dance, do all that stuff. But it's, it's funny, I'm not the slightest bit of an OU fan or anything, but, but every time that pops up on my timeline on Twitter or whatever, like, I got to listen to the gotta Malcolm listen Kelly. got to retweet it, got to mm -hmm. gotta listen to it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I communicated with him and Manuel Johnson at Gilmer. And I was like, what you guys going to do? I'm going. Okay, I got a couple guys out of East Texas that I, I met through the process but had knew about them just from Rivals.com and things like right. that. So that was it. And then when I went on my visit, it felt like home. Like, I went on a Christmas break, so I didn't really get the experience of all the students on campus, but I got the experience of – what bowl practice looked like, what the time schedule, oh, yeah. what they put into it, and the time they spend getting ready for the bowl game. So just watching that, I felt like it was home. And I met a guy named Curtis Lofton on my visit. <laughs> He's linebacker from Kingfisher, Oklahoma. Ended up playing for the Saints. Um, he walked up, was like, hey, what's your name? I told him my name. You don't need to go on no other visits. This is the place you need to be. I just kind of looked at him and was like, why would you say that? He was like, just trust me. Okay. I just kind of put it in the back of my mind. But at first I thought it was one of those things that he's a kid from Oklahoma. This is all he knows. Right. Like, this is why he wants us here. But that wasn't it. I think that was just a sign because, I don't know, he, he kind of solidified the deal when it came to not changing my mind after this visit. Like, I think God kind of put him there to like, hey, bro, you good here, just come. Because he was a big FCA guy, big church guy. And oh, I found yeah. all this out about him once I got to school. And I just feel like that was the solidifying moment to be like, this is where I need to be. 
That's awesome. Keena, I hate to cut you off having a great conversation. I want to talk more about uh, once you get to OU and everything, but first, mm -hmm. I want to hear a quick word from our sponsors uh, that make all this happen. We'll go to them real quick, and then we'll be right back with more from Keenan Clayton. At AFCO Roofing, we strive to fulfill our mission statement of protecting homes, strengthening families, and building community. It's more than a slogan. It's the heartbeat of who we are and how we serve our customers. Located in Sulphur Springs near I-30 and Broadway, there's no project we can't handle. Call AFCO Roofing for all your home and commercial property needs. Hi, I'm Lindsay Lee, realtor at Caldwell Banker Watson Company in Sulphur Springs. Born and raised in Hopkins County, I am the small town realtor you are looking for to help buy or sell your home. I specialize in farm and ranch, residential, and lake properties. Contact me today and let me do the work for you. Get your key with Lindsay Lee. I am Dr. Robin Boshears Patrick, located at Lone Star Clinic. I am a Silver Springs, Texas native, and I am dedicated to serving the chiropractic needs of my community. Call me today to set up your appointment and let's get you straightened out. Hi, I'm Audra Clark, owner and stylist of The Beauty Parlor. We are located at 206 West Shannon Road in Sulphur Springs, Texas. We are Tony and Guy trained and we specialize in custom cut and color. You're already beautiful. Come let us highlight it. And we're back. Keenan, we were talking about your recruiting process and everything and how you got to OU. Now you're at OU. Can you kind of walk us through that? Because, uh, I mean, you're, you're young. This is obviously kind of your first time leaving the house. You're pretty far away from home. Got a lot of responsibilities and everything. How, how just kind of put us in the mind of like a, a young Keenan Clayton when you're at OU? All right, come in first. Summertime, there's nobody on campus but the football players. Like literally, the, I graduated on a Friday. That Saturday morning, I was doing freshman orientation. Like, oh wow. Cause we did a camping uh, lock-in for high school. So like I walk out of the lock-in, dad's got the car loaded down. We headed young the way. Oh, first year was kind of rough because coming from here where I played both sides of the ball, I knew I was going to be a starter. Like it's just, the confidence level was there leaving. But when you get there and you got guys walk in, you got a safety, Nick Harris, from um, Alexandria, Louisiana, 6'3", 225. Oh, wow. You play safety? <laughs> Look at my dad. I don't know. So, you know, you find out that real quick that every guy that comes in was the guy at their high school. Right. And if they wasn't the guy, that was the second guy, and the guy that the was the guy probably went to SC or LSU or something like that. Right. So it was nerve wracking, like, oh my God, like I ain't seen this much talent in the room ever. Ever, yeah. So summer workouts, just imagine the first day you go in and they're all like, all right, we're gonna run 40s, 5, 10, 5, we're gonna do all this vertical. Well, we go to warm up and guys are throwing up. Uh-oh. <laughs> what if I got myself into, I'm four hours away from home, right. I can't go home and talk to my dad about this, and guys are throwing up, warming up to run 40s. Well, first of all, the warm-up was way more crucial than any workout that we had done in high school, so it's like, oh my God. But 5.30 workouts, not 5.31, no, 5.30. Yeah. Not 5.30. Be in the indoor dress ready to go at 5.25. If you're on time, you're late. If you're early, you're on time. That was posted in the locker room. Like, understand this, kids. If you're on time, you're late. First couple of days, roll in, right at on time, 5.30. All right, freshman, I don't have too much of this. That next week, rolling in, right at 5.30. Get out, see you later. Come back at 5.30 this oh, afternoon. Wow. What? Oh, it's that easy? I just come in late, get kicked out, come back at 5.30 in the afternoon? No, no, no. I got introduced to the, what they call the 
shortest, tallest building in Norman, Stairmaster. Oh. Before practice, <laughs> before the workout, that I since I was late that morning, that afternoon before I started my workout, I ride the Stairmaster on an hour level thirteen. Don't get off, don't stop, keep rolling. Get through, and then you go through the workout that you were supposed to do that right. morning. Now you're with the older guys. Things moving faster. And that was a wake-up call for me. Was that the last time you were ever late? Wasn't the last time I was ever late, but my freshman year, that was the last time I was ever late. And then I understood, like, they're not going to baby you. Right. They're not going to come knock on the door. You ain't, got, you ain't got dad coming in there telling you to get up four or five times, brush your teeth, let's go. None of that. You're on your own. I just grew up in two weeks. And, I mean, that also would have been a time, obviously, I mean, you had a phone, you would have been able to talk to people, but, like, that wasn't, you didn't just hop on Twitter and talk to your people when you were missing mm -mm. somebody or whatever. Like, mm -mm. you were you were by yourself. You were alone. By myself. And the only person I could call was my buddy John because he had just went to SMU the year before. Hey, man, y'all be doing this in the workout, so, hey, is this what y'all do? Y'all doing what? <laughs> oh, so we, we overdoing it. But then I started, then once I, after my freshman year, I realized there's levels to this. Right. It's, you know, and we were at a different caliber than SMU was at the time. So what they was doing and what we were doing, kind of similar, but our workouts were here and they were here. And So you I, had even got to the point where you didn't even have a person in your life that had experienced any of this. You were, you're by yourself. By myself. Which I, I do want to ask if you don't mind, uh, going to Oklahoma, obviously a lot of the people from here, huge Texas fans and everything. <laughs> Uh, did you get any kind of backlash from anyone here, or was it nothing but support, or how, how did that go? It was backlash, oh, you take sweet. But it wasn't, I hate you, rah, rah, rah. It was more of a comical joke. Right. I hope you have a great game, but Texas going to beat you out today type of deal. Or, prime example, Bam Jackson. I don't know if you know him. Um, his son, uh, Day Day. He was a wide receiver that went to Texas as well. Um, till this day, still heckles me, still bothers me. The week of, he makes means of me, <laughs> everything. And we got an ongoing bet. Whoever wins, the winning team, if we win, he had to take a picture in the OU attire. If they win, I got to take a picture in Texas attire. He got one photo since we started <laughs> this. so. That's that, and he, I still get a lot of backlash from people because I bring it on myself now. Are you Texas week? Are you Texas fan? Every time you post something, I'm under the comments, in the comments, boom, a sooner. Right. Oh, uh, Texas sucks, you know, just whatever I can do to kind of get under, ruffle your feathers a little bit. But it's all fun, man. Um, it wasn't, no one was not, was never supportive. If, right. You know what I'm saying? Like everybody was all supportive and just like when I went to Philly, it was the same thing. Two well, times a year, we're not cheering for your team to do good. We're cheering for you to play well, but y'all going to lose. I did want to ask that as well. Real quickly before we get to that, I have to ask, at what point did you realize, like, okay, I can make it to the NFL? Because you had some amazing teammates around you. Also, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact that you played with maybe one of the greatest running backs of all time. Yeah. Adrian Peterson. Okay, so can we go back to freshman year and, okay, summer, now we're going to tour days. I done kind of got to know everybody, got a good feel at 7 on 7, go up the full pads for one day. First guy, something happened with his equipment. Second guy, he minimal state. Go ahead, freshman, it's your turn. Okay, we in inside drill. And I had been harping to my cousins, I ain't never been ran over, that ain't gonna never happen. Well, the, today was the day. <laughs> <laughs> We're about day four of uh, two, uh, two days. This gap opened up about the size of two Mack trucks. And I'm filling this hole from the safety spot, and they're running power. Guard takes the backer. I'm filling the gap, and this guy is already full speed. How did you get that fast in three or four yards? It's like I was never there. Wow! Just right through you? Just right through me. I'm grabbing and trying to hold on to the shirt. Mm -mm. And it's one of those things where you get, you get hit and then 
you hear everybody at practice, ooh. <laughs> the last place you want to be at? The place I've never been. I grew up as a football player that day. Everything they were telling me about tackling, how to do this, how to do that, I listened. It wasn't a, all right, whatever, I know how to get this guy on the ground. No, sir. <laughs> Which, fortunately, you didn't have to run into too many other Adrian Petersons. There's not very many of no, many others like no, that. But. Not, not, not at that level. And, okay, I ended up red shirt in freshman year. Going into my red shirt freshman year, sophomore year, basically, my second year of school, I was starting safety. Had put the work in, had figured the system out of what I needed to do, figured out the defense. Second game of the season, we played Washington. I missed a tackle because I've never seen anything like this. Everybody in the front, the whole front get cut. D-line, linebackers, everybody cut. Oh, wow, okay, go in to make the tackle, back spin moves on me. He races for about 80 yards. Not a good start to my second game, so it was kind of rough. Um, later on in the game, I had kind of built my confidence back. The older guys wouldn't let me get down on myself. Later in the game, they come out in a two tight end set. Well, I got the tight end on the line. Corner has a, the wing tight end. The wing tight end goes slap down the field, wide open. Quarterback overthrows him. I look up, the other safety's coming in. Hey, what you doing? Coach wants you. Go to the sideline. You don't know who you got in coverage? Like, my guy never got off the line of scrimmage. Like, he's, he was covered. What are you talking about? Nah, you don't know what you're doing. Just get over there and sit down. Well, me being young, I throw a fit. Helmet flies. A few elf bombs. Mm. I never see the field again after this. Oh, wow. We go back and watch the tape. He turned around, he looked at me and was like, sorry, you were right. <laughs> you didn't play the rest of that game over something a, that you ended up being right about. Something that I ended up being right about. So to the media, they said, he's young, he don't know how to tackle. My response to the media was, well, why didn't they take me out when I missed that tackle in the first quarter? He didn't bench me to about two or three minutes, about two or three minutes into the third quarter. Can y'all answer this? Nobody had no answers. So at this point, I'm questioning myself, questioning my ability. I just going, I ain't gonna say I went on a downhill slope, but I started not to care about football as much. That's gotta be tough, cause like like you mentioned, you're already you know by yourself for the first time. You're at a, a different level and a different challenge. But for the first time in your life, you're probably having like you mentioned media and people like that. That's a whole extra level of and especially OU. That's a big school. Like there's a lot of coverage, you know. Yeah, uh, and now this is on Sooner Sports, ESPN. I can't go home without looking at some on College Football Live, and here we are. We're talking about safety gets benched for not tackling. All right, well, now I'm questioning myself. Like I said, I'm questioning my abilities. I never quit doing what I was supposed to do as far as working out, being on time, going to meetings. I just didn't really have the itch. Like, I just, all right, I'm here. Y'all going to see me home sooner or later. No. So going into my third year, which would be my red shirt sophomore year, I Going into camp, I just really, I wasn't feeling it. Like, I just, whatever. Well, about midway through the season, Coach Venables comes into the uh, to the DB room and is like, hey, got guys hurt, numbers are short, need somebody to come play linebacker. Nobody wanted to go. Cool, I'll go. DB coach don't like me, no way. I'll try it out. Well, that year I started playing a lot of special teams and he was teaching me outside linebacker. Well, going into the spring, getting ready for my red shirt junior year, I done figured it out. He done built my confidence back, made me believe that I could play, put me in a few games here and there to get the feel for it. I'm ready. Let's go. So this is about the time I start to realize I can do this. I can go to the next level. Watching the guys that were played this position before me, the numbers they had, the as far as testing numbers, playing numbers, the stats. Okay, my junior year come out, or going into that, my red shirt junior year, I'm a starter. I come out and have a great season. Four or five sacks, um, two picks, eight forced fumbles, like I'm all over the place. 
Okay, well, the guy that came in with me that I mentioned earlier, he gets drafted as a linebacker. Sixth round, I believe, fifth, sixth round. The light came on. If he can do this, I can do this. Not, not saying that he was a bad player or that he wasn't better than me in certain aspects, but I play with you every day. I know I've right. seen you do this. If you can do it, I can do it. And then after that, it was to the wall. Like, let's get it. Staying after work, after school. I mean, after after workouts, getting extra work, uh, throwing balls with the quarterbacks, working with the receivers. I, now I got guys that was there with me, telling me what needs to be done in order to perfect my craft and right. get where I need to be. Going into that final year, were the projections like that? Were people mentioning your name in mock drafts and everything, or were you even well, paying attention? Uh, my red shirt junior year, you know, we played Florida in the national championship. And that year, my grade was like a five, five. I was like, okay, I have a good season. It'll boost it a little bit. Well, coming out of that national championship, the whole deal was with everybody. If we win, we all gone. Well, we end up losing. Then you start getting doubt with guys. Oh, no, I ain't going, I ain't leaving. All right, well, hey, if you come back, and you come back, and you come back, and Sam, if you come back, we're gonna be good. We have a chance. Well, I'm not worried about it. Everybody coming back, we're gonna go into our senior year, back-to-back -back appearance in the national championship. Let's get us one before we leave. Going into my senior year, I wasn't worried about it. I said, I'm not gonna stress about this. I'm not gonna look into this. Well, of course, when you got Trent Williams, Jermaine Gresham, DeMarco Murray, uh, Sam Bradford. We just sent three guys off the O-line that went top four rounds. You got the recruiters there now, or the scouts. Show up at practice. Have a good practice. Show up at practice, now you got the eye. Now when they're watching the tape on these other guys, they're going to see you. Right. Do your job. That's it. That's all, that, that's all my uh, linebacker coach told me. Do your job, play like you know how, and everything else will take care of itself. So going into my, to my last year, my fifth year of school, um, the injury bug bit us. Jermaine Gresham dislocates a knee running routes on air. Sam gets knocked out against Texas. Well, he gets knocked out week one, shoulder injury. Re-injures against Texas. We lose Ryan Reynolds, probably our best defensive player, in the middle of the Texas game. And that went our national championship right there, right there at the Texas game. We knew if we lost that game that the, our chances would go out the window. Now we're playing with a freshman quarterback, sophomore linebacker that sleeps in all the meetings. <laughs> and a walk-on tight end that ended up being pretty daggum good. So, and then our O-line was fluctuating. You got Trent Williams playing center, guard one week, right tackle, left tackle, just oh, wow. piecing it together. So that Who, last year. by the way, goes on to have like a Hall of Fame NFL <laughs> career, but. Still playing, yep. still the best one. It's crazy, it's crazy what he's done. But yeah, that, my senior year, it was a good year. Uh, we ended up playing Stanford in the Holiday Bowl. No, nah, not the Holiday Bowl, the Sun Bowl down at uh, El Paso. It had Toby Gerhardt. Oh, really? Yeah. Toby Gerhardt was uh, a beast. <sighs> hey. So this this game, I get to play a little safety because we, we got injuries everywhere. Yeah, okay, I'm going to show these guys I can still play some safety because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to play safety. Linebacker was not an option for me. Like. I turned down Arkansas because they told me in my face, when you get here, we move you to linebacker. I like, well, y'all, there's nothing to talk about. Right. So, get to play a little safety. Run top sweep to Toby Gerhardt. He on the sideline. I bring everything I got. He just kind of like a fly. Hey, man, anybody else feel like I felt when I hit him? Like, oh, yeah, I done told you. He a man back there. That day, I said, hey, if the running backs in the NFL are running like this, <laughs> I think I want to find something else to do. <laughs> but that kind of gave me uh, what it's going to be like at the next level. And 
It was fun though. My senior year, I, I had a lot of fun, but I just wish we could have got back to that natty one more time. Right. One more time. So uh, I wanted to ask you now about specifically the the process of draft day and everything. I think I mean, for a lot of NFL players, like that is at least the first moment. You know, that is your I made it to the NFL moment. Well, can you kind of walk us through what that was like for you? And obviously, for anyone that doesn't know, you get drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles. Philadelphia Eagles, fourth round. Man, it's nerve wracking. It, it really is because you see some guys go off the board that you've never heard of. This guy? No disrespect to those guys, because I'm pretty sure they felt the same way seeing some other guys right. taken whenever they're looking like, where did this kid come from? Like, I've never heard of him. He played at that school? Like, that's, that's what's nerve wracking. I'm like, man. This guy, I played against him. I, I watched our guys kill him every Saturday that we played him. Second round, okay. Well, I had got a little insight that it wouldn't be first day. So the first day we're gonna hang out. I'm gonna call out my boys that get first round picks, congratulate them, ask them where we're going this weekend. What, what's the move? We all need to celebrate. So, I decided to have a block party. <laughs> Which sounds like a good idea. It sounded like a good idea until I had to clean up everything. Fair. Well, it was fun. We had a great night, bunch of food, bunch of people, bunch of boys that I played high school ball with. Got to see a lot of guys that I hadn't seen in a few years. Like It, it was like a, a reunion. Well, I stayed up too late. Saturday morning, my phone's jumping off the counter in the kitchen because I didn't take it to my bedroom. And my little sister decides to answer the phone. It's the Philadelphia Eagles. Oh, wow. I'm in there. I'm catching another girl with Z's. She, hey, get up the phone. Man, get out of here. Well, I finally get up, get on the phone, it's Coach Reed. Hey, man, you might want to be awake for a day like today. <laughs> <laughs> He said, I mean, it's probably one of the biggest days of your life. And we talked, you know. He, Did you tell Andy Reid that he also has problems with clock management sometimes? This is just the Hey, <laughs> if my jokes was on point and I knew that he wouldn't be like, well, you know what, we'll take another right. guy and send you home, right. <laughs> probably would have. But uh, he, you know, he just kind of told me, hey, your life changed a little bit, but what do you know about the Philadelphia Eagles? Nothing. I'm a Cowboy fan. <laughs> Well, I'm pretty sure you was a Longhorn fan too. See you in a couple weeks. Short, smooth, talk to your agent, get it done. Well, I've been in the corner before I can even say anything to my dad. They done, they announcing it as I come in the living room and scrolling on the bottom of the TV and stuff. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's kind of something that you can't explain. Like my big thing was, I'm not gonna cry. I'm not crying like, Nah, I ain't doing it. Well, when your dad starts crying and you hadn't seen right. him cry since Papa's funeral, and that was the only time you ever seen him cry, it just kind of brought it out of you. But, man, it's just, it's something that you really can't explain. Like, the best explanation that I can give anyone is something that you've ever dreamed about as a kid and to put the work in and see this dream come true, if you've ever had that happen, it's the same feeling, no matter what it is that has been accomplished. NBA draft, MLB draft, one of the best wrestlers, uh, writing a novel. When you accomplish that goal that you done put your last 18 years into, it's a, it's a release, like, I got it done. But now it's the next step of the dream. What are you gonna do with it? And then that's when you find out that the NFL means not for long. No more goal is to make, first of all, make the team. Right. Get in the Because I mean, even as a fourth round pick, obviously as a fourth round pick, you're gonna get plenty of chance. I mean, they, they would obviously rather not have quote unquote wasted a fourth round pick, but you by no means have that spot. You, you have the spot, but you don't have the spot. The, 
the advantage that you have is that they've invested this amount of money into you. Right. People wonder why first round picks get a lot of chances. Jamar Russell, we done invested 40 million into this guy. <laughs> we gotta get right. something out of him. Right. So that's where you have the leg up is the money that they've invested. But at this point, it's a business. They don't care. First day, guys, all right, we'll give you no chance. That second day, I'm writing checks for this for my quarterback that's triple what I'm paying you, so to get you out of here is nothing. Right. So, of course, the first thing is make the team. Make the team. That's, that's all you're worried about, making that 53-man that roster. Well, you get shook up when you walk into training camp and it's a 34-year-old with five kids. He, uh, he on a different level because he got to feed five kids. You got right. a guy over here that's – 27, 28, he got two or three kids in a family. You got some guys over here that's 32, no family. Like, you got a little bit of everything. When we leave here, we're not going to play Madden and 2K. These guys going home to their families. What they bring to the field is a different hunger than what I'm bringing because I just got me and my dog. Right. This is the most money I've ever seen in my life. If y'all let me go, I can go back to Soul Springs and be great. Right. It's just me and my dog. Some days I was, my level of play at practice was here, and some days it was here. Once I figured it out, I kept it here. But these other guys that's feeding kids, their level of practice is here. Then when you go to the game, their level of play is here. My first NFL practice was like a college game as far as speed, oh, wow. the way guys was moving, everything was crisp, no mental errors. You got guys, and then I'm in awe, you got Michael Vick throwing 70 yard bombs. Oh my God, like I, <laughs> what, what, what are you is, supposed to do about that? Yeah, this is the guy I've been watching all my life. Like you'll find yourself dropping in coverage and you'll get lost just watching him maneuver and do what he's supposed to do. You gotta separate. On top of him being like the fastest person on earth. You got to, and then you got Deshaun Jackson, Shady McCoy, blitzing off the edge on Jason Peters from Queen City. Knew he went to Arkansas as a tight end. Now he Hall of Fame career, right. and you got to find your niche, and you got to find your groove within all of these guys that you've been a fan of or that you know of personally. Like, I, like who who wasn't a fan of Michael Vick? Right. Michael Vick didn't start losing fans till the dog fighting stuff came out. Before that, he had the whole like he was like a. He was on the a, cover of video games. He was. He, he was, was like a everything. Tom Brady without the rings, as far as fan base and how people love to watch him play. Right. <laughs> and then you got guys on the defense, uh, Lamdi Asanwa, Asante Samuel. Coach, you want me to watch the linebackers move around? I'm out here watching these Hall of Fame corners pick balls off and cover guys. Like, I'm interested in this. Right. That was the hardest part for me, to not be a fan. Which, I have to say, I mean, you had a, a lengthy career. I mean, most people do not have near as long of a career as you, as you did. If you could credit it to one or two things, what would it be that this is how I was able to stick in the league as long as I did? Not thinking that I knew everything. Learning something new every day from the older guys that's been in five, six years, that's experienced what I'm going through, the, the single man in a new city, country boy in a city. I could throw a rock out of my condo and hit the front door of a casino. How can I fight the urge to not go shoot dice in the casino? Right. Teach me how to stay out of the bars and the clubs. Like, what do you guys do? What do you do, what do, you do in your all time? Like, I'm to a point now, I'm 22, 23 years old. Like, I want to get out of the house. Right. Then that's when you find out about golf. You start to like amusement parks, the zoos. And then the best thing that I heard from one of those guys was, the money that you spend at the casino and the bars, you could be going out the country. Once they turn me on to the passport and the get out the country. You never even thought about traveling or anything like that, huh? My first time traveling was from 
on a plane with from Oklahoma to UCLA for a game. Right. And I'm having a conniption. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. I, you put me on the bus? Like, I, I'm not getting up there high in the air. Right. I'm not doing it. That's when I found out about Ambien. Here, kid, take this. When I wake up, <laughs> we done landed and we we're getting there. off we're the good. plane. Yeah, but, man, I'm telling you, I the, traveling, that like, could we have traveled as a kid? Probably so, but my parents weren't that as knowledgeable about traveling out of the country and stuff. Our traveling was going to Six Flags or right. to uh, Hurricane Harbor, and I had an auntie down in Houston. Like that's the farthest that I had traveled. Right. So when I realized that, oh, this is all I need this little book and get a stamp and I'm good. I realize how much, how privileged we are in the U.S. when you go to places and you explore, like the Dominican for, a, for, for an example. They don't even have electricity. But you didn't see one person over there without a smile on their face. Right. Going through the day happy. That is what I felt like kind of kept me around as long as I did because I realized that this could stop at any time and I could be like these people with no electricity. How would I react to this? Enjoy the moment. That's one thing my grandpa always told me. Enjoy the moment. Like that, you hear it now, be where your feet are. I was hearing that at five, six years old. Be in the moment. So that helped a lot. Uh, if the injury bug wouldn't have grabbed me, who knows? Right. Might be, I could possibly be still playing. Or I would have had a, a well, a lengthier career than what I did. I got four years in. I mean, the average is three years and done, two and a half. I was about to say, I mean, and that's the average or whatever, but think about how many just super, super, super talented, the best player, anyone that they knew knew that didn't get anywhere close to that, you know. One of the things I want to ask you, uh, I can't keep you here all day, unfortunately. I wish mm -hmm. I could. I'd sit here and talk to you forever. But you had mentioned um, the learning that you don't know everything and trying to learn something every day. The very first time I interviewed you was uh, right before you had started coaching here. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned that same thing when I asked you about uh, goals as a coach and that kind of thing. And you really made it sound like you were trying to take that and then take it into coaching as well. Yes, how has this first year gone? Uh, and now that you have a whole year under your belt, you know, how did the first year go? How you know, much of a better coach you think you are now than when you started? Just kind of walk me through this first year. First year was rough. Well, I'm not even gonna say the whole year was rough. The first few weeks were rough because I'm learning how to deal with high school kid, teenagers, and I gotta learn that they're not as advanced as some of the guys that I've been around or on the level that I've been on. So some things that I say to them, right over their head. They never catch it and they looking at me all wide eyed. And then I had to, my language, my language. When I got to college, cuss words was not a, uh oh, he cussed. Right. That was like a normal language. So, me, can, me and my language, that was the hardest part by far. Relating to the kids, that was easy. Teaching the kids, that was easy. My mouth, <laughs> <laughs> that was the hardest part. But the first few weeks, man, Training camp, scrimmages, the, I, I was good, man. I, I wasn't letting it get to me. The first couple of weeks, Frisco Hive come out. Okay, a few, few mistakes here and there, it's a different ball game. Lovejoy, I was so sick in my stomach because I felt like I wasn't doing enough. I'm not doing enough. I'm not teaching them enough. I've well, to this point in your life, you've always been, well, on the field, but you were like one of or the most talented person out there. There was something that you physically in that moment you could do to help, you know. And that, I, I can't go out here and play for him. Right. So, 
after the Love Joy game, I had a little powwow. Shout out to Coach Jita for keeping me keeping me level headed and not letting me just this ain't for me. I'm gone. So after that, I just I just more so I just like man, be yourself. Relax. Quit trying to be. Don't quit trying to be a robot and be do everything right because you you can't. It's not possible to do everything right. And then once I figured out that if I just be myself, the kids would they have free flow too. Right. And now I'm starting to figure out personalities, how you can coach this guy, how you can yell at this guy. This guy doesn't do well with yelling. Now I'm learning. Y'all just don't know. Y'all have taught me a lot in these three weeks right here, these first three weeks. We ain't won a game. It's easy to, when you lose them, to just rah, 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 rah. Right. MF this, you not doing this, you suck, wah, wah, wah. No, 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 that's not the answer. Let's back up to step one. Look at, look at myself first in the mirror. Am I teaching them enough? Am I teaching them the right way? Or am, am I putting in enough work to help them? Then once I sat down and just calmed myself down and had a powwow with one of my cousins, <laughs> And after that, I was, I was good. I, I found my niche. I was, I was relaxed. I was just being myself. I just let myself go and coach and have the energy that I needed. But them first few weeks, man. But as far as the year, I feel like I've came a long way as far as being comfortable with the kids, being comfortable in practice, being comfortable in letting my opinions flow, but not the wrong way. Voicing my opinion on certain situations, saying what I think would work and what, I w what wouldn't work. Now I found my groove to kind of just let it out and not be demeaning anymore. And as far as the kids, man, it's just, they actually make the day good. No matter how much of a knucklehead Riley Hammonds is, he gives me something to laugh and smile about. Like, whether he knows it or not, I'm excited to go to my flex time and athletics period, because he's in my flex, we play cornhole. And I want to ask him, how do you have so much energy every day? But that's just him. Right. You know, and he taught me a lot. He has taught me a lot. And hands down, I got to give him his props. He has taught me a lot. He's taught me how to just have fun with it, no matter the situation. I will say, sorry to cut you off, as someone who's just an observer, I mean, I guess I do cover the team as well, but mm -hmm. uh, as someone just as a fan of sports, I always find myself gravitating to players who you can tell, you can't explain it, but you can tell they are loving what they're doing. They're yeah. enjoying themselves. And just watching Riley Hammonds on a football field, whether he's gotten a pick or whatever it is, like yeah. you can tell he is enjoying himself he's out enjoying there. He's enjoying it. Him... I mean, I can go on for days about the guys that I think are enjoying it and having fun, but I personally get to deal with him. Right. So I guess it makes the connection a little better. But um, you, you think this is something you see yourself doing long term? You want to continue to grow out and everything? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, like I told you before, long term goals, I want to be a DC. And after that, if head coaching is a call, that's fine. But I was in that window after ball of what do I do? I mean, of course I'm going to work, work, find me a job, find something to do to keep money flow. But what is it that I'm going to do that I love to do? Right. I love coaching. Now, the teaching side of it, it's growing on me. And the reason that it's growing on me is because I'm building a relationship with students that are not athletes. Right. And some of these kids are very interesting. Like, I'm talking about interesting. Like, you know that in high school? I didn't know nothing about that type of stuff. I learned that like last year. <laughs> and it's just having conversations with some of them is just like, wow. And I find a few that, you know, that I've read that I've touched that came into my class and they were lazy, wanted to sleep. And we talk about life. And now they're the most attentive person in the class, you know? So to be able to make that kind of difference for somebody. That has to be huge. I will say one of the things that really stuck out with me, and you've mentioned it multiple times when we talked, but you are, I think, maybe because you've got so much support from Sulphur Springs, or maybe you're just naturally this way, but you're one of those people, like, 
you always preach, you know, you're at every basketball game and you're always talking about, I want to support everybody, whether it's basketball, whether it's band, whether it's UIL, whatever, like we need to, you always mention when I ask, is there anything you want to say, you always mention, we need to go support these kids. And it sounds like you are still very much continuing to do oh, that. Yeah. Uh now, soccer, I owe y'all an apology. I ain't got out there yet. It's cold. It's cold. <laughs> but, uh, man, when I got to the league, I grew more respect for golfers, tennis players, swimmers, and cheerleaders. Those aren't sports. You're just hitting the ball. Well, when I went and played golf for the first time and I got back and I could barely walk the next day because right. stuff was sore that I never knew would be sore, I earned a respect for that. And I realized how hard it was. So at 15, 16 years old, you three strokes, a hole in one, that is amazing. Right. You putting up great numbers on the golf course, I, I want to see this. I just want to go check it out. I know you can't cheer loud in golf, but when it's time to clap, I'm going to let you know I'm there. Right. Tennis. Tennis players are by far some of the best athletes. Change of direction, on a dime, all day, and the touch on that racket. I try to play tennis, I'm hitting the ball out of the course. Right. <laughs> How is Serena Williams hitting this ball so hard, but it's not flying out with of the stadium? Of yeah, with that kind of control. And to watch them work out and do stuff, I just feel like more people need to see the game of tennis like this. These, to track a ball that small, change direction, and have the touch that these kids have, that's amazing. And basketball, of course, I just, deep down inside, I love basketball. I probably was supposed to be a basketball player, but I know I wasn't tall enough, and I didn't have the dribbles to be a guard. Just love basketball, man. It's, it's not over football, but I like it. I could definitely see that. Keenan, dude, thank you so much for taking oh, yeah. the time to do this, man. We'd have sat here and talked to you for like three more hours if we could have, man. We oh, really yeah, appreciate sure. it. Thank you all so much for joining us for another episode here on Chad's Media. On behalf of Front Porch News and Chad's Media, I'm Tyler Lennon. Again, we want to say thank you so much to our sponsors for making this happen. Y'all stay tuned. We've got, another, we've got more stuff coming up later this month. We've got Kay joining us again. I know y'all are going to want to see that. So thank you all so much. We'll see you all then.